Okay, let's stand as you are able. And we are going to begin by reconciling ourselves one to another by passing the peace. And we do that, morning Brendan, we do that through peace be with you or peace be with you, some people like. Um, in whichever way you are comfortable, we are not yet out of the pandemic, okay? All right, and then when you're done, you will turn to me and you will say, and peace be with you. And I will say, peace be with you also. Okay? All right, go. <laughs> and just, just remain standing. Just, just stand and remain standing. And as you are able, of course. And, and peace be with you also. 
So stay standing. <laughs> because we're just going to move into the opening prayer, which is standing anyway. So your presence here today changes things, right, Steve Dixon? It changes the world by the act of inviting God into your heart and your thoughts and your community. And we all say, Amen. Are you looking at me? No. Okay. All right. Stay standing. Good morning, Emmanuel. Our opening prayer today. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Creation rejoices. The birds sing from every tree. Alleluia. Christ is in our midst. Babies babble with sounds of joy. Worlds cannot express our overflowing hearts. Alleluia. Christ is our light forever. Amen. And remain standing if you're able because our opening hymn is Voices United 412. This is the day. <laughs> who are here to come forward as well. You got it? I know there are some here, so come on forward. You can sit right there. And if you, children, if you don't mind just sitting here. I would need a helper okay. or two. I'm not doing chairs. We're just going to sit on the floor because that's fine. See, Fiona, can you come sit over here, please? Hi, Brenda. I'm going come to on, need baby. some helpers. <laughs> oh, great. This is so one. great. Okay. Everybody, this is this is Lynn. Hi. And she and Delaney. Hi. And she's going to give you your story today. And Connie's gonna right. help. Yeah. Yes, please. There we are. Okay. Yes. 
So good morning. It's so wonderful for Lynn and I to be here today, uh, representing the Children's Needs Distribution Center. We are the coordinators, but there are lots of volunteers behind us who make it happen. I want to thank you so much for the CNBC having been chosen as the recipient of your coin drive. Um, it's wonderful. The other thing I want to say is it's not the first time that the CNBC has partnered with this church. If you remember pre-COVID for a number of years, uh, we at the CNBC had what we call the Christmas cupboard. So in no, late November, December, when our clients came, they were able to pick up one new toy per child to take home for Christmas. And for a number of years, your White Gift Sunday donations came to us and helped us uh, stack our stock, our, our Christmas cupboard. So this is a thank you for both of those things. A little bit of history. So the CNDC is a really good example of what one seemingly small deed can accomplish when one person does it. So back oh, a long time ago, 1992, at Christmas time, there was a, a mom in our church who heard about a refugee family who had just come, and they had children, she had children, and she thought, ah, I'm going to go through my children's things, their closets, and see what I can find and give to this refugee family, and she did that. Then she thought, there's more than just one family out there in need. Maybe I could think a little bit outside my resources. So by February of 1993, she had a few other moms from our church, Highland Baptist, and they had gathered together some donations. And that was really the beginning of the CNDC. So at first, these women would pack up a box for a particular refugee family and actually deliver it to them. Well, then more donations kept coming in, which was wonderful. So then the church was able to give the CNDC a dedicated space in the church. So then clients would come, families would come to the center and be able to pick up, pick out their own things. So fast forward 30 years, which kind of blows my mind, it's 30 years we've been going. Um, now, every Tuesday morning from 9 to 12, about 15 families will come in by appointment and they will be able to pick out things for their own children, what their children need. So in a month, that's about 150 or more children served by our center. Now, it's not only refugee families, although that makes up a good portion of our clients, but it's also people uh, on OW, people who are working poor, could be a teen mom trying to make it on her own or a dad, uh, could be grandparents who suddenly have to look after their little grandchildren or people who've had a devastating fire. We have a wide variety of clients and everyone is certainly welcome. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Lynn and the first, the next slide, and she's gonna tell you about how the center works every Good morning. We could not operate our center without the generous donations of the community. And all every day through the week, people can come to our church and at the back door, they can drop off their boxes and bags of donations. And opening up these donations is kind of like opening up a present because we have an idea of what might be in there, but sometimes we get some surprises too. So I've brought along a bag that might be typical of what we get, and I wonder if I could have some people, help, little ones, help me unbag this bag. Would you like to come and help? Inside here are typical things that we might get. So if you want to come up and you can all take something out of the bag and you can show the grown-ups, just reach in, there's a quite a few things there. There might be a couple of things that you can each get. Just pull it out, honey. What have you got? A bib for a baby. You want to show everybody? You want to turn and show you your moms and dads? And stuff. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. And what did you find? Some rain boots. We have lots of rain boots at this time of year. Would you like to reach in and get something? Honey, would you like to reach in and find what's in there? What else is in there? What did you find? <gasps> Show everybody. <gasps> a baby doll, they're popular. As fast as they come in, they go out the door. Everybody likes a baby doll. Would you like to reach in and find something? You can, yeah. You can reach in. You can just pull out a couple of things. Oh, what have you got? Blue jeans. Yes, we go through lots of blue jeans. What have you found? You can reach in again. Ah, what have you got? A pretty thin, look, show the hat. It's an alligator with sunglasses. <laughs> and you want to reach in again? There's still more things in there. You can have a turn. Go ahead. Oh, that's a bathing suit. And it's getting to be bathing suit season. Yes. Do you want to reach in now? What did you find? Oh, baby toys. We get lots of baby toys. Okay, you can reach in again until the bag is empty. There's a few more things in there. What's this? Storybooks. We, we get wonderful storybooks. Okay. And stuffies, all kinds of stuffies. The adults like the stuffies as much as the kids do, let me tell you. Do you want to reach in too? Oh, what have you got? Oh, running shoes. Yes, we need lots of shoes. Would you like another turn, sweetie? Okay, come on up. Okay. There's still, oh, pajamas, car, and another pair of shoes. So those are the kinds of things that we find when we open up these boxes. And if you want to switch to the next slide. Can you look up there? Can you look up there? This is inside of our church where we work. And so once we get all these bags and boxes, we need lots of help to unpack them. And we could not survive without our volunteers. Um, and so they come every week and they help us unload all these boxes and bags. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do with all of this. So there are some pictures of people who are sorting. If you go to the next slide, there are some more people sorting. We just open up the bags and see what's in there and you can do the next slide. And then we have to have a place to put them so that when the families come, they can find things. So we have to divide the clothes. We have a boy side. Can you guess which side would be the boy side? What? Which one? You're right. And then the girls is on the other side. Then we have another whole side just for babies. And we have racks to put toys and puzzles. And you can go to the next slide. Then we take, and then downstairs we have all of these shoes where they can go and buy, see what, what shoes they need. And you can go to the next one. And then we take over the gym on Tuesdays and we put out racks that have dresses and skirts and coats and jackets and bigger baby toys um, so that they can come and look in there as well. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. And then you can go to the next slide. And then we have a whole cupboard full of books, plus we have boxes of books so that they can choose as many books as they'd like to take. And you can go to the next slide. And then um, it, during the winter, what we have liked to do is we have one day where we dedicate as a coat giveaway. So we take out all the winter coats and snow pants and jackets and mitts and hats and we put them all out and people can come and choose the outerwear that they need for their families. And you can go to the next one. And then sometimes we get even things like bassinets. And even though we get all these generations and people are very, very generous, sometimes we run short of things. We always need new socks and underwear. They're very popular. And now recently we need diapers. And we don't get very many donations of those things. 
So monetary donations are most appreciated because then at least we can su supply some of those things that we don't get on a regular basis. And the other big aspect of our program, which is unique in the region, is our car seat. We are the only agency in the region that provides free infant car seats to families. And Connie is the expert on the car seat, so I'll turn it back to her and she can explain that part. It all started actually around 2003. We had a, a, an inquiry from Grand River Hospital as to see if we would partner with them uh, to help families who arrive in the hospital. They have their newborn baby, but they don't have a car seat. They don't realize they need one to get out of the car out of the hospital, uh, and it has to be a safe one. It doesn't have to necessarily be new, but it has to be safe. So we took up that challenge. And since then, uh, we probably uh, give out about 100 car seats a year. Uh, and these are new. Uh, we have been getting them directly from a distributor. This is the biggest uh, area of our programs that we need your money for, because uh, we have to fundraise for the money from to buy all these car seats and 100 our seats at, uh, they've been about $85, now they're going up to about 110. Uh, that takes a lot of money. So for that, we absolutely appreciate your coin drive and a lot of that money will be going towards our car seat program. So that's who we are. Again, a huge thank you. We do have a little bit of information down in your uh, gym, your fellowship place and afterward, we'd be happy to uh, answer any other questions you might have and we have some brochures if you want to take one home if you have families who might want to donate to us uh, feel free to take take a brochure so thank you very much and of course we thank you for because we run our own volunteer outreach and we know the level of commitment that that takes so thank you for serving families within our community and now um, we are going to stay seated for our centering hymn so let's just listen while the singers sing oh, no, it's not Two to 14, verses 22 to 32, the Common English Bible. And Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, now this, listen carefully to my words. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man whose credentials God proved to you through miracles, wonders, and signs, which God performed through him among you. You yourselves know this, 
in accordance with God's established plan. And for knowledge, he, has, he was betrayed. You, with the help of wicked men, had Jesus killed by nailing him to a cross. God raised him up. God freed him from death's dreadful grip. Since it was impossible for death to hang on to him, David says about him, I foresaw that the Lord was always with me. Because he is at my right hand, I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my body will live in hope because you won't abandon me to the grave, nor permit your Holy One to experience decay. You have shown me the path of life. Your presence will fill me with happiness. Brothers and sisters, I can speak confidently about the patriarch David. He died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this very day. Because he was a prophet, he knew that God promised him with a solemn pledge to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Having seen this beforehand, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he wasn't abandoned to the grave, nor did his body experience decay. This Jesus God raised up. We are all witness to the fact. John 20, 19 to 31 from the Common English Bible. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors, they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are forgiven. Thomas, the one called the twin, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, believe. Jesus re or Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. Herein lies with them. Thanks be to God. A beautiful life to see. So how is it that we move from the hallelujahs and the hallelujahs of Easter Sunday, a morning of energy, right? Was there energy last Sunday? Melissa's like, yes. And celebration only to be punted into the story of doubting Thomas a week later. Which, by the way, is the same amount of time that Thomas waits to see the risen Christ. So this week's readings are about belief in the risen Christ. We hear Peter's convincing sermon to Jesus' followers. But a side note here, you may wonder at the change in Peter from the thrice-denying Good Friday shirker to this astonishingly bold Peter in Acts. What has happened here? Who is this Peter that we're meeting? Confident and articulate and certain. So certain. What we have here is a reading that has been snapped up from the Pentecost readings we'll hear about in another six weeks. We are listening in Acts to a post-Pentecost Peter. Doesn't seem fair to stand him beside side by side with the poor doubting Thomas, in my mind. Now Thomas. His doubt brings us to a multiplicity of things to consider. A conversation about doubt as a platform for faith. Jesus' response to our doubt. The perspective where we view Thomas's doubt, 
And remember, Peter is full of concrete assurance only because he has experienced the risen Christ a number of times already. And we have the risen, yet still wound-bearing Christ appearing to his most beloved. What I would like to explore together this morning is what it means to us that Christ comes to us and comes to humanity wounded, not yet scarred. That would be easier to see, perhaps, the healed Christ. Steve, can you bring up the picture? But he comes to us as God wounded. Do you think the wounded Christ is part of the ongoing narrative of God's compassion towards us? How many wounds and scars could we reveal to one another at this very moment? I'm sure those wounds and scars each came with varying levels of trauma for us. And Jesus' wounds were exceedingly traumatic for the disciples. His death was terrifying. And the term we would be more familiar with in this time in history is that Jesus was the victim of a lynching. Yes, I said that, a lynching. Here I have the Encyclopedia Britannica description of a lynching, a form of violence in which a mob, under the pretext of administering justice without trial, executes a presumed offender, a presumed offender, often after inflicting torture and corporal mutilation. So I think we could confidently say, based on this def definition, that Jesus was lynched. Now that word, lynch, makes my heart race, literally, as I was looking up the definition. And my mouth go dry, and I feel a terrible dread come over me. Anxiety, fear, and really great unease. Now the first time I heard the word lynch used in the context of Jesus' death was from the black theological community. It's a word embedded in a brutal history. So if I, a white woman living in a democratic society in the year 2023, instantaneously trembles at the thought of a lynching, we can perhaps imagine what the effect was on the disciples. So a bodily resurrection after witnessing the terror of Jesus' death, do you think, would be pretty hard to believe. And rightfully, People in these stories had a hard time believing. And maybe this is a good time to also review the religious definition of resurrection. The rising from the dead of a divine or human being who still retains his or her own personhood or individuality, though the body may or may not be changed. We know Christ was appearing having come through locked and solid walls. The properties of Jesus' body had definitely changed. And with that, Thomas and the other apostles witnessed he also still bore the wounds of his death. And the reading in the book of Acts has Peter recounting what we did to Jesus' body. And Joy J. Moore, a black theologian, posits, does what we believe about God transfer to the body of Jesus? Or what about wounds that we inflict on one another? Wounds born out in scars on humanity, communities, and of course, persons. So in the weeks leading up to Easter, we walked through the stories of Jesus healing. Spittle and mud washes away blindness. Lazarus himself is raised from death. And a woman at a well is restored to her community. Jesus came as the healing one. And even when his closest allies have not only abandoned him, but handed him over for the lynching that will cost his life, 
He returns to them. He returns to them. We find them grief-stricken and scared and not quite certain what to do next, how to carry on. And into this time of uncertainty, Thomas makes a request. He wants certainty that this person the other disciples have encountered is really and truly his Lord. Thomas, you may note, asks for nothing the other disciples haven't already received. The disciples seemingly take Thomas's demand in stride. We don't hear of derision. Indeed, the story of Thomas's doubt is included in the Gospels. It prompts me to wonder if asking Jesus for proof, a sign that he is with us, that we are seen by him, that we are important enough to be seen by him, is a very important part of our human journey. It would appear so. Caroline Lewis simply states, the resurrected Jesus finds you and meets you wherever you are. He found Mary in the garden as she bravely came to grieve at his tomb. And later in these stories, he finds the apostles on the shores returning to their work as fishermen. And in this story, he finds Thomas carrying his doubt like a mantle about his shoulders. Thomas, who has waited a week after Christ has appeared to the others. We are reminded that the first chapter of this gospel, the Gospel of John, declares to us, the Word became flesh. A warm body with blood coursing through it, breath to bind the Spirit to those apostles. God is close. And Matt Skinner, he intuits what Caravaggio's painting does, this encounter between Christ and Thomas is strangely intimate. Yes? Yes. The word made flesh. Close. Intimate. It appears our God is a God who does not shy away from the vulnerability of our bodies with their scars and their wounds, their fleshiness, their breaking downness. Some of us are born to bodies we don't recognize as fitting our sense of ourselves. Our God is a God of incarnation, of metamorphosis, of renewal. God wants us to know suffering is a part of God's experience in and through Jesus. And then, like Jesus, we can and do transform to become in tune with ourselves. During one of our Lent readings, Jesus invited Nicodemus to be born again. Our bodies may change, we may bear the scars, but we are transformed to become our truest, our truest image of God as we walk this journey we call life. So Joy Moore has mucked about in this fleshiness of God. And she reminds us that in the Greek culture, the body was thought to be weak, and the spirit was held in the highest regard. At that time, spirit was the mind. But she says as she considers this passage about Jesus and Thomas, there is a return to the physical body, some hope-filled idea about a God who we know, listen to these words, they're beautiful, who we know labored over a lump of clay and a God who donated dignity to dirt. There is value in the body of the risen Christ and the story it tells. And Caroline Lewis echoes, this body is the incarnated God. As such, it is an affirmation of what happens to bodies, none of which even God can escape. And she adds, Jesus' Jesus' body provides sustenance 
for our faith throughout this story. I say the risen Christ offers his body to us through this strangely intimate encounter with Thomas. Do we feel the intimacy? Do we shy away from it? Or are we as bold as Thomas, poking our fingers around to get a firm grip of who Christ is? We love to think Jesus Christ needs everything clean and tidy. And Joy's question, percolating from Peter's sermon in the Acts reading, is what we did to Jesus' body what we do to the idea of God? Does that transfer to the body of Jesus? Because Jesus' lynching was messy. The whole miserable thing was messy. And God was in it. Do we understand that? Because John tells us the word became flesh. And flesh gets messy. When we read the stories of the Bible, we find the messiness of life. Sibling rivalry, murder, long-awaited hopes for births, long-awaited hopes for land, a bride, prosperity, victory, community, health, sight. I guess we could say almost anything as we people might long for or secretly desire, we find in these stories. Thomas stated his specific desire. Did he intend for his request to be answered? We can't know. But when he was given the proof, he responded with increased faith. My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Now often in my sermons, I refer to the wandering lives of the patriarchs and the matriarchs of the Jewish people. They didn't follow a clear path to reach where God ultimately led them to be. Look at the Apostle Peter. He is shouting from the rooftops now, but a week ago, he was slinking in the shadows. Huh? Life is so messy. Our bodies are messy too as duplicitous as Judas. A multiplicity of ailments and disease ravage our flesh, our bones, our muscles, and sinews. And only this week I was aware anew of the vulnerability of our bodies. Just this week, in this week, of our bodies through cardiac failure, ravaging arthritis, and the loss of our mind's ability to remember. We bear the wounds and scars, and through Thomas's audacity, we can be assured God is in it with us. God is strangely intimate with us. Through water, through dirt, through bread and wine. These are simple physical elements created through complex processes, the collision of hydrogen and air, decomposing natural matter, or dirt, the fermentation of yeast, water, and flour, or bread, and finally, of crushed grapes. God walked through a journey of death as the human one. From these readings, we come to an understanding that straightforward belief can be hard won, and hard to come by. And sometimes those things we ask for, the proof, may take a little while. And we may stumble around in seeming darkness. It's okay. It's okay. I'll say it again. It's okay. Jesus shows up in a body that refuses to hide its suffering, its sorrow, its brokenness. How often have I heard people say they cannot come to church because they are too grief-stricken, too sinful, too angry, too confused, too unsure. But here's something. We all are. 
at some point anyway. The resurrected Christ finds you and meets you wherever you are. And we know this as we walked with Jesus through the stories of Lent. God encounters us wherever we are, in isolation at a well, in our blindness, in our mourning, and our, broken, our breaking down dying. And now we know God is in our pain and our sorrows and bears scars along with us. The word truly became flesh. Amen? Amen. Now let us stand for the singing of He Leadeth Me. to take a moment of silence to hold these people named before you in prayer. Let us begin. 
and our pastoral prayer is responsive this morning. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us a little child, one of us, flesh and blood to share in our humanity. For God so loved the world. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us a, a carpenter, and yet in whose creative hands a world was fashioned. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us as fishermen, and yet pointed to a harvest that was yet to come. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us a teacher and opened eyes to truths that only the poor could understand. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us as healer and opened hearts to the reality of wholeness. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us a prophet, priest, and king and yet humbled himself to take our place upon the cross. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who came to us as servant and revealed to us the extent of his father's and mother's love for humankind. For God so loved the world. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, who rose from the ignominy of a sinner's death to the triumph of a Savior's resurrection, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son for the sake of me and you and other sinners too. God so loved the world. Blessed are you, Lord Jesus, our Savior and our Redeemer. Now let us pray together in the words that Jesus taught it, taught us, saying, Our Mother and our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And I'm going to invite Neil forward for a minute for Emmanuel. Three minutes, Neil. <laughs> Brenda gave me three minutes. <laughs> we'll see how this four goes. if you're Four if I stretch it. So yesterday, um, here at Emmanuel, we held a meeting between the four Waterloo United Churches, that being us at Emmanuel, First United, Westminster, and Parkminster. And as you can see in the slide, that was about 27 people. And the people from Emmanuel that attended included myself, Mary Sulis, Amanda Broderick, um, Karen and Stephen Dixon. And I'm feeling I'm missing somebody. Oh, and Pat. And there we are with the other oh, yeah. final results. So we spent the whole morning, and we had kind of three categories we were brainstorming. One was what were some common challenges between our four churches? Second, where there's areas for greater community service between our four churches. And finally, with some opportunities for collaboration between our four churches. Um, I don't think it comes as any surprise that all churches these days are doing their best to try to figure out how can we reimagine ourselves. We thought it might be useful to see how everyone else is doing it as well. Then we had lunch. And then afterwards, we kind of broke into groups, kind of grouped by um, what people's responsibilities were at church. So we had one for people from session and mission and service, one for the trustees, one for the chairs of the boards, et cetera. And then we had a conversation amongst ourselves to see, at least in my case, as a chair of board, talking to the other ones to say, so how do you run your church? And having talked to all, four, all of them, uh, it's a miracle. And I let you, they all do it differently than we do. And yet we all go forward in our mission together to serve Christ in this community. So then at the end of that discussion, um, we then voted on some top opportunities of what we thought might be ways, at least baby steps, we could start doing some things um, that might help each other. And among other things, we said we should do this again sometime and have a meeting. So you can see some little pieces of paper uh, behind us there. So the four things we decided to do, um, one 
was that we realized that very often the four churches do things, but we don't tell each other what we're doing. And, you know, so perhaps we might like to go to their um, fish fry, they might like to come to our spaghetti dinner, that kind of thing. So we're going to put together a newsletter that um, perhaps monthly or some other regular interval goes out to the members of all four congregations to let them know about the things that are going on in the other four churches. Um, there was also some discussion about perhaps the outreach efforts could be pooled in some way. Uh, in many times, if you're all filling out the same grant applications uh, for the same kind of funding, perhaps, you know, you've all found shortcuts that can help each other rather than each person, each group having to do the forms all at once or separately. Um, second, thirdly, uh, we decided we should try to have some sort of inter-congregational youth programming. This was something that we had done with Parkminster before COVID. Um, I think if I recall correctly, uh, Parkminster had the younger youth group, we had the older youth group, and we swapped kids. Um, so now afterwards, we did some counting and realized that if each church has three youth, you know, three children of a youth age that would be useful for a youth group, that's kind of a small youth group. But if you took those three and brought them together as a, as a dozen, that might make for some more opportunities for um, getting to know each other and doing some larger activities. So. And then finally, um, we'd like to consider um, exploring the, the various combined worship services that we've done in the past, like we did for Good Friday, like we did for Ash Wednesday, um, like we will be doing on June the 4th for Anniversary Sunday, those kinds of things. But at the same time, recognizing that each church has its unique culture, has its unique way of doing things, and that we are four distinct congregations who have separately found our ways forward. Um, but by worshiping together, we can share some of those ideas and see what others are doing. So that's kind of the high level of what we talked about yesterday. And again, if after the service you want to find out more about what happened, um, by all means, talk to me, chair of the board. We've got Mary, we've got Amanda. Amanda ran away. Coffee. Please. I was told specifically to thank Amanda Broderick for bringing us all together and making this happen. And now she's not here. So all of you, go talk to Amanda and tell her thank you for putting it all together um, yesterday. And uh, we will keep you posted as you go on ahead. Is that right, Amanda? You're perfect. That was perfect. Whoop, whoop. Way to go, Neil. All right. The invitation to the offering. And uh, so let's just begin. Let us offer our gifts freely this morning, stepping out in faith down the road of grace. And there are still many ways to send in your offerings and donations and listen to our music. And the many ways you can give will be on the screen and all the kids and those of you that still want to be a kid can come forward. We're doing the children's time collection. Woo -woo. Come on, little one.
All right, are we ready for a prayer? For the gifts that we have received and the gifts that we will receive, we give thanks. Generous God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have shown us what it means to love. And you call us to follow your example, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, to continue to write your law of love on our hearts. Give us an unwavering passion for justice and a tenacious faith that will not rest until the hungry are fed, the oppressed find relief, and the outsider finds a welcome. Amen. Amen. All right, closing hymn, May the Blessing of God Be Upon You, number 429. <laughs> The love of God be reflected in your hands, the wisdom of God be reflected in your words, and the knowledge of God flow from your heart, that all might see and see believe. Now let's sing our Amen.